kind of water, Spring Creek water. I've had a chance to fish this kind of water most of my life and I really love it. There's a certain characteristic about Spring Creeks that you find in no other kinds of streams. The water's clear, you can often see the fish, you can certainly see them feeding. And they rely mostly on insects for the food that they eat, which is ideal for fly fishing, especially dry flies. And over the years that I've had a fly fishing shop on one of the most famous spring creeks in the world, the Henry's Fork of the Snake, I've learned a lot from my own fishing, but I think I've learned even more from so many of the people that I've met there in the shop. That's been a great thing for me because I think it isn't so much that I've learned the answers to all the questions, but it's the questions themselves that have really helped me a lot, and especially with flies that I've developed. There's a lot of real important challenges in developing flies that work on this kind of water. This type of water is really intimidating sometimes for people that have never really tried it, and so are the fly patterns. The fish get a real close look at the fly. Another characteristic of spring creeks is that there aren't a lot of different species of insects. The fish don't see a lot of different kinds of, of food, and, but what they see is very prolific. A lot of spring creeks only get two or three species of mayflies during the course of the season but the surface might be just literally carpeted with those same mayflies, and the fish may see those for several weeks at a time during the season. So that also makes them very selective. So those two characteristics, the fact that the water's clear and the surface is smooth so the fish get a very close look at the fly, and the fact that the fish get to see an awful lot of the same insect during the course of the season, gives us some special challenges in tying flies. And I get asked a lot of questions about the flies that I've tied. I've tied flies since I was a boy, and those patterns have developed into some very specific flies that have proven very effective on this kind of water for me. And I frequently get asked how I tie these flies. And that's what I'd like to do, is share a lot of this knowledge that I've learned over the years from not just my own fishing and my own experiences, but that I've learned from others. And it's a lot of fun to be able to create patterns and tie them that work on this kind of water, because I think that spring creeks offer the ultimate challenge for the dry fly angler and these patterns are going to really help increase our odds. I think mayflies are the best known of all the aquatic insects on trout streams, especially spring creeks. And when there's a hatch of mayflies coming off a stream like this, I'm really in seventh heaven when the fish are up and feeding on them. And the flies we tie to imitate mayflies have some specific considerations. When we look at the surface of this smooth, flowing, clear stream, it's important to realize that the trout may be feeding just under the surface, or sometimes they might be feeding on insects that are actually riding on the surface. But I found from my own experience that most of the flies that work best are those that are fished just under the surface or, or right in the surface film. And I have some patterns that imitate some of the mayflies that I've found really effective that I'd like to share with you. I'm going to show you a few flies that I like to use for fishing spring creeks and tailwaters. And it's great to be here in my home in St. Anthony to kind of share some of the flies that are my favorites. And the river's just right out here about 100 yards, and I spend a lot of time out here field testing these flies. And that's one of the great, certainly the greatest parts of fly time.
I want to start out tying a fly that I guess I'm best known for. At least I get requested to tie the no hackle using mallard quills for the wings uh, more than any other fly when I do demonstrations around the country. And I actually did this fly once earlier in a video I did with Jack Dennis called Tying Western Dry Flies. But I've worked with a lot of fly tires since then and due to the difficulty of learning to tie this fly, I feel like I've come up with a few additional tips on how to tie it that might be worthy of doing this one more time. So if you already have that other video, I think you can still maybe pick up a couple of tips if we redo this fly one, once again. It's a simple fly. All we need to use is some wings, a body, and a tail, and that's it. You want a, a good dry fly hook that is a fairly light wire. And my favorite is the TMCO uh, Model 100. And generally I tie no hackles from size 12 down to as small as you can tie them. They're not really well suited for real big flies. Size 14, 16s, and 18s is where they really seem to work the best. Mayflies, even though there are hundreds of different species of them, most of them only fall within about four color groups. Usually the body color is what we're most concerned about. And those colors include olive, a lot of mayflies are olive, uh, kind of a pale yellow to a cream. This encompasses our pale morning duns in the west and the sulfurs in the east. Tan is a real common color for a lot of a lot of mayfly species and it's also a neutral enough color that if you don't have the right color uh, tan is is going to get you by in most cases and then one other color that we find a lot of mayflies are that have kind of a gray to a dusky body and if you'll tie your no hackles and other mayfly patterns in those four colors uh, you're going to be able to cover about any hatch that you're liable to encounter. The one that I'm going to tie today, we're going to encompass a, an olive for the body. So I'm going to use uh, green thread and this olive superfine dubbing, synthetic superfine, which really works great. Uh, we're going to use some mallard quills, and, and these are the complete wings, and I've collected these off from ducks that I've hunted myself and what I do is I just cut the wing at the first joint and just dip the end in a little bit of borax and then put these wings where they can dry out. It's really important if you're using your own feathers to make sure that they get air dried. I remember once a guy sent me a bunch of wings, a bunch of duck wings and I was all excited to get them because I really was going through a lot of them when I was commercial tying and UPS delivered the box and set it on the sidewalk and I looked at that box and it was almost just moving and I thought oh I don't really want to open that box well I, I had to open it and sure enough it was just crawling with maggots and what the reason was is the fellow had enclosed these wings into a plastic bag so the air couldn't get to them and they'd really spoiled so it's important to get this completely dry if you're going to use your own feathers. Now, the first feather, the first primary wing feather has a very stiff leading edge and this is true on ducks or geese. It's not a good feather to use for no hackle wings but this part of the feather is great for wing cases on nymphs and, and more importantly this side has these real stiff little feathers that are sold as biox and a lot of times you'll go in a fly shop and see just a strip of, of biox that you can use for tails and this is where they come from and I like to use my own so I usually save this feather off of each wing. You need a right and a left wing to tie the no hackle but it doesn't have to be off in the same duck. I've had people ask me that before as long as you get the curvature. Now this first feather that's behind that leading feather, this 
primary feather is excellent, as are the next five or six feathers here. We'll pull this one off too. Now you can also buy wing quills packaged just like this in the shop, and that's certainly fine as well if you don't get the complete wing. If you're going to learn to tie no hackles, I can guarantee you, if you buy the feathers like this, you're going to be spending some money because you're going to go through a lot of wings. That's the most common question I get asked is these are, how can I learn to tie these? And the real secret is tie a lot of them. And the more you tie, the better you're going to get at it. All right, so we've got our wings. And for the tails, we're just going to use some hackle fibers. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is put a little coating of thread on the hook. Start at the head, wrap back down to the band. So we got a foundation to put the materials on. Take a little tiny bit of dubbing and just wrap it on to form a ball. Now, I must admit I've had some fly tires show me some great ways to split tails that may be better than this way, but this is the way I do it, so you don't have to use this method. The important thing is you want the tail split, and what I'm doing is just wrapping a little ball of fur, wrapping the dubbing right over itself just to make a very small little ball. I'm going to pull off one of these nice hackle feathers. This is a, a dark dun color. Usually I like to use uh, sh a shade of dun for the wing, just because it's so, or not for the wing, for the tail, because it's so neutral. And we're going to pull off about six or eight fibers. Make sure the tips are even and lay these on and tie them right on top of the hook shank. Now the length of the tails should extend about the same length as the body. Then we're just going to take about half of these fibers and, and hold them on one side and half on the other and just work back forming a little V. And this V, if you do this right, should be about 90 degrees so that those tails will really help balance the fly. Then we'll go back, move the thread back to the thorax position, which is one third of the distance uh, from the eye of the hook. We're going to cut our wings. And the first one is going to be from the one, from, it doesn't matter which side you cut first, but this one's going to be from the far side. And a question that often comes up is how wide do you cut these wings? The wider the wings are, the better the fly is going to work because you're going to have more material. But it's going to be more difficult to learn to tie. So I'd start with narrower wings and a good measure for you to start out with is to make the cut so that it's about the same width as the gap of the hook. So I'm using this as a measurement. Now these wings I'm making are considerably wider than that. As I said, you want wide wings, but it's something that you're going to have to work into. I would get proficient with narrower wings and then you can start going a little wider after you get some experience. The next step is to hold these wings and make sure the width is about the same and also the height's the same. And then we're going to hold these wings in position and just rest them now against the, the shank of the hook. They should be the same height as the body is long. Now we're not pinching them against the shank of the hook, we're just resting them against the shank. And the first step is to lift the thread. The bobbin has been lifted from this position to this position, which is the tip of the bobbin is actually slightly higher than the shank of the hook. 
Now you can't see this because my hand is covering the wing and that's one reason this fly is so difficult to learn to tie. You can't really see what we're doing here. So you pretend the wing's there. Now this, the procedure is going to be to, to wrap the thread all the way around the wing without applying any tension in a 360 degree angle. The, the problem is when I've completed almost the full turn I'm hitting the vise. I've run into the vise so I've got to drop the thread enough to clear the vise but then lift back up so that I end exactly in the same position I was when I started which is directly uh, parallel to the shank of the hook and slightly higher. If you end up lower than the shank of the hook, your wings are going to lay down. I can guarantee it. So let's go ahead and do that now and I'm going to talk my way through what I'm doing with the thread once again with the wings in place. First I lift the thread then I bring the thread around in front. Notice there's absolutely no tension around the front wing, around the back wing, and now I would run into the vise if I didn't drop below the vise and then lift back up and now I'm back to the starting position. Now I'm going to apply a little tension just to crimp the front of the wing. Then I'm going to bring the thread forward and I'm going to apply tension straight forward. I'm going to do the same thing one more time. Back, forward, and then before I release any pressure, I'm going to make a couple of tight turns to anchor the wing. And if I've done that correctly, those wings are going to stand up every time. If they don't, it's going to mean that I didn't apply the pressure in the right place. It's really critical that the thread maintain no pressure on the feather until you make that first pull straight back and a little above the shank of the hook. Now we're going to cut the excess material and the next step now is to divide the wing this is important because we're going to work the dubbing down inside of the wing. So we're going to go between the near wing and the shank of the hook and just make a little bit of pressure forward and make an anchoring turn in front. Then we're going to do the same thing with the back wing. The back wing I found I need to give it a little help, kind of hold it up as I put tension on the thread and then a couple of turns in front. Now we've got the wings mounted in position so we're going to transfer the thread back to the little ball of fur so we can apply the dubbing. Another question that I frequently get asked is why not put the body up as far as the wings and then put the wings on. The reason is, is because you really can't work that thread back under the wing to, to put the perpendicular pressure like you should and the wings are going to end up laying almost straight back if you put the body on first. I don't know, I've tried it, I don't know any way to make them stand up. Now if you're going to use some cement on the wing, use a little drop of this Dave's Fleximant. I'm not going to use it on my own flies that I use. I don't want any cement because all it does is adds weight. Sometimes I've been asked, do I coat the wing? And that is the worst thing you can do because if you coat the wing, you're going to add more weight than the actual feather. And also, you're going to, without air being able to pass through the individual wing fibers, the thing's going to spin and you're just going to make yourself a little helicopter. And you'll make a couple of casts and your 6X tippet that was two feet long is going to be in a little ball right in front of the hook. I can guarantee that. So be real sparse if you use this cement and put one drop right in there at the base of the wings. I'm going to do that just to show you in case you need to.
The advantage of using a little cement is that when you're first learning to tie these, if your wings aren't real stable, this will give you an opportunity to put a little cement in there just to kind of hold them in position a little better. Now I'm going to put a very thin amount of dubbing. And I can't stress enough how important it is to stay very sparse with dubbing. Use less than you think you're going to need because you can always put more on. Again, we dub as close to the wing as possible and working forward and just leave a little bit of room to tie off a head. And we'll whip finish. and our fly is finished. And as I said, this is a hard one to learn, but it's an easy one to tie once you do learn. And the important thing with the no-hackle is that you have a very good base for the fly to rest on. You have the tails and then the wings kind of coming out the side. And this fly is actually going to work better after the wings split up. I think sometimes uh, this fly gets a bad rap. I've had people come in my fly shop and I've told them to take some no hackles to match a particular hatch and they'll say, no, I don't like those because they're not durable. And I say, well, gee, how come? And they say, well, because I make about one or two casts and the, the wings split up. Well, that's really what the wings are designed to do is to split up. And it is amazing to me how someone will reject a no-hackle and yet they'll buy a, another mayfly imitation that has a hair wing, which is already a bunch of split up fibers in the first place. So obviously that doesn't bother them to have a bunch of individual split fibers. And another thing to consider is the wings on this fly are much more durable than anything else I've found in natural materials. For example, if you take a hair wing fly and just take your finger and thumb and really try to shear the wings off, you're not going to have much trouble doing that. But with a no hackle, you can't believe how tough this stuff is. The other thing is how water repellent it is. Hair wings uh, are just hollow. And they're really not water repellent. They just float until that hollowness gets broken. And then they don't work worth a darn. And once they get wet, they're wet. But with the no hackle wing, uh, you can catch fish after fish. And it's a simple matter of just blotting the water or the slime out. You might want to dip the wing in some of the uh, fly floating crystals and you're ready to go again and you can catch fish after fish. And this is the fly as it looks after it's been fished. This is the fish catching fly. When the wings are all nice and beautiful in the fly shop, that's the time that they're a fisherman catching fly. But you don't want to be on any spring creek without some no hackles. It's going to be one of the most effective mayfly done patterns you're ever going to find.